Okay, that's your history lesson for the day. Uh, uh, what do we do, like half an hour of questions, and then I'll let you get on your way. I know you're not shy. Yes. Why don't you stand up and... Um, we, uh, we, we, we do uh, have some different views as to uh, how to do this job about constitutional interpretation, less so about statutory interpretation. But there's no question that on, on, um, on, on, on some things we disagree and we disagree vehemently. I think uh, people overestimate how much of our work uh, are those kinds of cases in we hear about 80 cases a year, give or take. And of those, probably 40 of them are decided unanimously. So there are plenty of times when we sit around the conference table and we're agreeing with each other, not disagreeing. Of the remaining 40, um, I would say uh, 25 are ones which are either lopsided, they're eight to one, they're seven to two, or they're um, split along not predictable lines at all. If you looked at them, you would be surprised if you had a kind of conventional view of who was supposed to be on what side, right? Because it's, they're very mixed up. Um, there are about 15 cases a year, I would say, where we divide in fairly predictable ways. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, typically we do that because we have different views of how to interpret the Constitution and because we have different views of the commitments of certain constitutional provisions of what they of what they mean in the world. Um, uh, most a lot of constitutional provisions are of course quite vague in how in, in how they appear. They don't give specific instructions as to um, how to decide cases when some when when a constitutional provision says the people are entitled to equal protection of laws or or that they're entitled to the due process of law. Um, uh, that's not, a, you know, it's not like saying that a, somebody has to be 35 to be president. We all know what that means, but we don't know what it means to give people equal protection of the law, especially as applied to concrete cases. And at that point, in interpreting those kinds of provisions, views about how you think about uh, those provisions, uh, whether you look back to exactly what was permitted and what was prohibited in the year in which they were enacted, or uh, whether those provisions provide um, uh, a more, you know, a, 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 a set of principles um, that were expected to and that should develop over time. So that, I mean, the principles stay the same, but the way they're applied changes as the circumstances in the world changes so that you're not permitting exactly the same things nor prohibiting exactly the same things as was permitted or prohibited in 1789 or in 1868, as the case may be. So that, those differences in method reliably produce different outcomes. There are also differences in, in, in what people think equality means and what people think due process means. Um, uh, uh, and we do differ. Now, so your original question was how do we get along? I think we get along, uh, we actually get along quite well. I mean, I think we all like each other a lot. I think we all respect each other a lot. I think we all understand that all of us work in good faith. I think we all understand also what gives rise to the disagreements. So they're comprehensible to us. Um, if, you, if you start from one set of premises, you're going to get one answer. And if you start from another set of premises, you might, you're going to get another answer. Um, I think we know that we're repeat players. We come back, we sit in the same chairs, we decide more cases. If we're going to hold grudges, it's going to get in the way of our doing that. If we're going to yell and scream and call each other names, it's going to get in the way of our doing that. Um, uh, the person who may be, who you may be in vehement uh, disagreement with on one case, uh, you may need for a fifth vote in another case. And so there are sort of good pragmatic reasons uh, to keep cordial and good relations. 
But, you know, in addition to that, I guess I would say, um, I don't know, don't you have friends who you vehemently disagree with on certain things? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, there are people on this court who I uh, disagree with on, on some legal issues, but who I think are really good people and funny people and kind people and interesting people and who I'm proud to be friends with. Uh, and um, so, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's not always easy. This is an, uh, we're doing important things. We're doing things that make a difference in the world. Uh, it's sometimes, you know, natural that people uh, care a lot about uh, these consequences and you know, care a lot about the fact that you're on, uh, you know, especially you get pretty agitated when you're on the losing side of something that you think is really important to the country. Um, but you have to be a grown up about it and uh, you have to give people the benefit of the doubt in terms of how they're approaching legal issues and just understand that there are going to be disagreements and, uh, and realize that you know, you can, you can respect and admire and like a person who you're going to disagree with. Yeah. I'm wondering what you think about the precedent now of not, um, not confirming justices during election years and what the consequences of the increased politicization of the court in American eyes is. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, it's hard to know what the precedent exactly is. And whether, you know, these rules, they change a lot. So I wouldn't think that, uh, you know, it, 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 it all depends. You know, there might be an election year in which somebody will say that's the rule, and the next election year somebody will say that's not the rule. It wouldn't depend, I guess I'm saying, on that rule existing for all time. It seems to be a little bit more case specific than that. Um, uh, as to politicization, is that, is that the, the question? I mean, it, you know, uh, from the court's point of view, it was a lot nicer and a lot better when everybody was confirmed by these lopsided votes. Um, if you look at my older colleagues, most of them were confirmed by those kinds of lopsided votes. Uh, Justice Scalia, before he died, of course, was, uh, you know, he was a kind of controversial figure. He had strong views on things, which some people very much like and some people very much dislike. I think he was confirmed in 98 too. Um, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is another sort of controversial figure. She has strong views on things, which some people like and some people dislike. And she was confirmed something like 97 to 3. And there have definitely been periods where the expectation has been that if you have a certain set of qualifications and if you look like you're going to be a responsible judge, even if um, uh, uh, somebody thinks that there are going to be some set of rulings which they'll disagree with, the expectation was, nonetheless, the president was entitled to um, his Supreme Court pick. Um, uh, that appears not to be the case anymore, and it's, it's hard to know how to get back to that. There's so much tit for tat for tit for tat that goes on in these uh, processes. Everybody has their list of times that they've been wronged. The Republicans have their list and the Democrats have their list and they seem to be uh, over time ratcheting up the level of conflict rather than trying to find ways to ratchet it down. Uh, it's very hard now to get a bipartisan vote uh, coming onto this court. Um, uh, when, you know, uh, for, for Justice Sotomayor and for me, for Justice Alito, who of course was uh, nominated by uh, uh, a Republican president. Uh, all of us, the, who, who uh, and Justice Gorsuch, so the, the last four appointments, two appointments by Republican presidents, two appointments by Democratic presidents, you know, each of us got a handful of votes from the other party. Maybe it was a bigger handful, maybe it was a smaller handful, it wasn't much. And, um, you know, that's, a, that's an unfortunate thing because it makes the world think that we are sort of junior varsity politicians. Uh, I think that's not the way we think of ourselves, even given the fact that we disagree and that we disagree sometimes in ways that you can predict. 
based on what kind of president appointed us. I think we're disagreeing over traditional methodology and principle. We're not disagreeing because you know uh, one person is a Republican and one person is a Democrat, or because one person likes the president and another person doesn't, or, or those um, sorts of uh, more political reasons. And uh, but these votes do make it seem as though as 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 though we're just sort of an extension of the political process. And that's long term, I think, very unhealthy for the court. And it's something I think all of us wish uh, we could get away from. But you know, speaking uh, practically, and, and just looking at the process as an observer, a little bit as a participant, having gone through one of these uh, sets of hearings, it's 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 a uh, it's unfortunately hard to see how to get back to that world in which Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg could have been confirmed by 98-2 votes. Yeah. Well, um, certainly the last part of your question is none of my business. Uh, what, what public unions do at this point in time, what state legislatures do at this point in time, uh, is something for state legislatures and public unions. And until, you know, what we try to do at, on this court, and it's a very important principle of the American judicial system, is um, we try to decide the cases before us. And we don't try to render opinions on issues more generally. And uh, we don't try to um, give advice to other actors in the political system as to, as to uh, uh, how they should respond to our decisions. Of course, it's important to understand that our decisions have real-world effects. It's important to understand how they affect various parties and various uh, other folks in the country, um, and uh, 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 and to and those consequences are part of what one thinks about, just part, but part of what one thinks about when one enters into a decision. But afterwards, uh, I think it would be improper. Uh, to comment on like what what unions should do, what policies they should uh, go forward with, or for that matter, what state legislatures should do in the wake of uh, of, of of that decision. Um, was is there a part of the question that I didn't answer that I can? I'm I'm not really is sure. It about Uh, well, I think, you know, my opinion said what I thought about that. I mean, I'm not going to be able to say better here what I said in 35 pages in, in, <laughs> in my dissent. Um, uh, you know, I think that the dissent was pretty clear. This was a question about whether essentially right to work clauses are, are constitutionally mandated. There are, um, there were, uh, prior to this decision, 23 states in which if, uh, if you were a member of a public sector union, let's say you were a teacher or a police officer or whatever, if, if there was a public sector union uh, in your workplace uh, and you were not a member, you nonetheless had to pay dues or had to pay, you didn't have to pay dues, you had to pay an agency fee, which was the monetary equivalent of dues. And the idea was that the way our labor system works is that uh, a union is an exclusive bargaining agent. The union, uh, once voted in by a majority of the employees, the union represents all employees and indeed, by law, has to represent all employees. The union can't bargain just for its own members. And so every employee in the workforce gets the benefit of what the union negotiates at the bargaining table, gets, you know. The, the, the wage increase that the union has negotiated for, or the health plan that the union has negotiated for, or whatnot. And 23 states, not everybody, 23 states, had decided that in that situation, um, uh, it's appropriate to demand of the non-union members that they pay an equivalent fee, essentially, because they're getting the same benefit. 
One rationale for why a state might want to do that is a kind of equity rationale. You're getting the benefit. Another rationale is that if you don't do that, essentially everybody has an incentive to become a free rider. Everybody drops out of the union. Why should I pay for something that I'm going to get anyway, essentially against any kind of rational self-interest? So I drop out of the union. That means that the union doesn't have a base of support. That means that the union isn't well-funded. And if, if, and this is an if, but if, a public employer, a city, uh, a town, whatnot, um, wants to have a stable, exclusive bargaining agent to bargain with, they're not going to be able to because the union will have essentially kind of, you know, either they fall apart or they're just really weak and they can't do anything because there's no, there's no funding for it. So some cities and states decide that it's better to bargain with one party than to try to figure out how to bargain with an entire uh, workforce. And, and wants these agencies' fees as a way to stabilize that kind of relationship. That's been a political decision. Some people have thought it made sense, some cities, some states. Some people thought it's the stupidest thing in the world, and that's why 28 states have allowed it, and 20, 23 states have allowed these agency fees, 20, Seven have not been their place in the city and whatever. Um, uh, what the court did, this is a long answer to this question, but since probably nobody else knows what Janus is other than what the court did, they said that that's no longer um, an acceptable choice. That to demand that people pay one of these agency fees is a violation of their First Amendment rights because you're requiring subsidization of the union's bargaining activities from people who don't want to subsidize it. So I went on at some length, as I said, the majority opinion is about 50 pages long if you're interested, and the dissent was about 30. I went on at some length about uh, why this um, was not a violation of free speech principles, um, when, uh, uh, why uh, this was appropriately a choice for the political branches, and why, having recognized those two things for the last 40 years, because there was a prior decision about it, why the court should adhere to strong judicial principles of following precedent, what we call stare decisis, uh, and not overrule this prior decision that has essentially regulated this area for the last 40 years. So that's what um, my opinion talked about. I think it, you know, as if you read the decisions, uh, this is one of those cases where both sides think that the other side is almost incomprehensible. Um, it's, a, it's a sharp disagreement, and it's a disagreement as to sort of the fundamental premises of what we're talking about. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that the court was wrong, and uh, unions, it's not that unions should be, it's that states and cities should be able, if they want to, which they might not, which might be a good choice or a bad choice, but if they want to, states and cities should be allowed to do this. It's not a pro-union opinion in that sense. Um, it, was, it was not, you know, you started by saying you expressed concern that public employee unions will die I have no idea whether these unions are good or bad, but the states and cities seem to have a view on that question, and my view is that that view ought to be respected. Things can change, of course. New people can get into the court with new ideas. 
But that would be my prediction for at least the short term. Um, why is that? I mean, I think it's a very hard question, actually. I, I, I think, uh, you know, general principles of transparency would, should, 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 would suggest that people should be able to see what we're doing. There are not all that many seats in that courtroom, and not everybody can get to Washington, D.C., of course. I think in some sense, it would be a good thing from this perspective of, you know, do people view us as politicized? Actually, for people to, to, to see what we do. When I was Solicitor General before I became a justice, um, I not only argued in the court every month, but I came to the court whenever anybody in my office argued. And that meant that I was kind of sitting as a spectator in the front row for about three quarters of the court's cases. So I sort of got to see how the court seems when, you know, day in and day out. And what struck me was, uh, is it, you know, the court does an awfully good job. We look like we're serious. We look like we understand the cases. We look like we're really trying to get to the right answer. We don't look as though we're falling asleep. We don't look as though we come in with the answer for the most part. Uh, you know, for the most part, I think we, we, we do a pretty credible job out there. And you would think, well, let people watch that and let people see that we're really trying hard to get to a, a good answer and uh, that we're, uh, and, and that that's, you know, what they should demand of a government that we can do. So on the other side, the other side is awfully powerful too. On the other side, it's like, well, if, if we are doing that kind of good job, uh, why mess with success? And why take a risk that that will change once you put the cameras in? And this really goes to the question of like, how grown up are we, I suppose, and how grown up do we think we are? But not just us, lawyers and other people outside the court as well. I think, you know, some people, they'll, they'll they point to Congress and they say, is there, is there anybody in the world any informed person in the world, let's say, who thinks that congressional hearings became better uh, uh, when they put cameras inside those those hearing rooms? And I think the, the answer to that is no. I mean, uh, uh, cameras in a congressional hearing room have worked no end of damage to the seriousness of those proceedings. I just think that that's true, and I think even the people across the street would admit that that's true uh, in uh, behind closed doors. Because if they play to the cameras, they, they're, you know, these humans are not really about gathering information anymore. They're about creating a video clip that you can send out to your constituents. And we don't have constituents in that way. So you might think that we would not be subject to the same dangers. And that, you know, I think, I, I have a good deal of faith in this institution. I think that that's probably true. But on the other hand, you know, we're human. On the other hand, lawyers who appear before us are human. They'll start talking a little bit more than um, sound bites and bullet points. Uh, and then, of course, there's the question of what people do with this stuff. So I'll give you one example that I think everybody on this court, no matter which side they were on in this case, really just it took us all aback and made us kind of freeze. Um, uh, in one of the, in the first big health care case, the Obamacare case, um, the then Solicitor General, who's a marvelous, marvelous lawyer, uh, gets up to the podium and has a coffin in that. You know, just, it happens to people. And uh, uh, that's okay, Kat, I got it. And, you know, and it was a little bit embarrassing and it was not a good way to start your argument. And, uh, and then uh, an advertisement came out literally within hours. It was an advertisement by people who were um, uh, opposed to the Affordable Care Act. And it basically, you know, it, it, it used a, a clip of him, it was an audio clip, but it used an audio clip of him coughing and then had some tagline about how like, not even the government's lawyer could, uh, could, you know, could, uh, could bring himself to make an argument about this. And people can use video in ways that might be quite damaging. 
to the way we view our process. And uh, so that's, you know, a real, real concern. I don't think it's just kind of made up. And, uh, uh, and as I say, I think for most of the court, maybe all of the court uh, right now, which you know, I would say all of the court with varying degrees of, uh, of vehemence, uh, I think that that's decided. Uh, yes. to know what hat you're wearing. You know, like uh, a politician has one hat, president has one hat, a legislator has one hat, a judge has another hat, and you have to know what, what role you've been placed in and what it's proper for you to do and what it's not proper for you to do. And, uh, you know, I think that this is true of lawyers generally. I think that um, uh, when you're a lawyer, pretty much every position that you're in, there are certain things that you're being called on to do and uh, certain other things that it's just none of your business to do or that would be detrimental to the charge that you actually have. And often the, 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 the role that you play, uh, you have to separate that out from your uh, you know, general views about things or your political views about things. And so I think that that's something that lawyers are pretty accustomed to. It's, it's, it, it just goes with the territory. I think for judges in particular, I mean, what we're trying to do is interpret law. And uh, so, you know, I can look at a statute that Congress can pass, and I can say, that is one terrible statute, all right? But, but nobody really asked me whether it was a terrible statute or whether it was a good statute. Not only didn't anybody ask me, it would be inappropriate for me to actually comment on that matter, because what I have to say there are two people before the court, and what they're arguing about is what the statute means. And it doesn't really matter whether I think it's a good statute or a bad statute. I have to be as fair as I possibly can in saying, look, look what the statute says, look what people said about it, look, uh, you know, and this is what the statute means, regardless of whether I like it or not. And I think that that's true um, sort of across the board in terms of what we do. But we have to fairly interpret legal texts, uh, and we have to interpret them, uh, 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 you know, regardless whether we think we would have written those texts or not. Now, in the constitutional realm, it gets a little bit more complicated. Because in the constitutional realm, you look at something like equal protection of law or due process of law. And, uh, and, you, and, and your job is still the same, is to interpret that text as fairly as you can. But that text doesn't give you a whole lot of stuff. And in trying to figure out what else you look to and, and in, in trying to give specific meaning to these very general constitutional provisions, it's more likely that your you know, view of the world is going to come into play. Um, uh, I still think you have to be really self-conscious about that. You know, it can't be like, I just, you know, let me give you an example. There are some, there, there are actually some constitutions, let me go back to a different kind of constitutional provision. There are some constitutional provisions that are pretty clear in what they, in what they say. You know, take for a silly example, you have to be 35 to be president, okay? And if I wake up one day and think, that is a really dumb provision. I think you can be a great president at the age of 33, all right? And in fact, I have a great candidate, right? I love this person who's 33 years old and right now stands for president. Well, I don't get to go in and say, I'm sorry, this 33-year-old is really good. Uh, and I have to follow the law, regardless what I think of it. The law says 35, it says 35, okay? <coughs> so that's what I mean by wearing different hats. Now, as I said, when you're interpreting these broad, general provisions, it gets more complicated. 
It's not like it just says something and you apply it. You have to figure out what it means. And in figuring out what it means, uh, it's, 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 it's definitely more possible that your views of the world enter into that. Um, when, you, when you ask whether the Equal Protection Clause allows for affirmative action, something like that. You know, some people's views of racial equality are colorblindness, and other people's views of racial equality are not colorblindness, but taking account of the world as a whole and ensuring that folks have uh, equal opportunities to advance. And some people might even think, uh, no, it's ensuring that folks have equal uh, results at the end. I mean, there are a wide variety of ways in which people can view the concept of equality. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and so, it gets more complicated. But even there, I really think, you know, that the job of a judge, and I'm quite confident that all my colleagues would agree with this, is one has to be quite self-conscious about what you're doing, about, about the degree to which uh, non-legal, not, not strictly legal views are informing your decision making, and you have to be very careful about how and where that's true. All right, last one. Um, so on, on that point, I'm so sort of curious why, why you think that. So like, um, you know, I think it could be argued, I think, quite well that the like, law is pretty political by its nature, right? So, um, you know, is it that you're worried about people following your work with these decisions of precedence, or like, why, why should you be so conscious about not? Yeah, because I just don't agree with that. I mean, I think that law and politics, although they do respect, although there's no, there's no, um, you know, it would be naive to say that they never touch each other, that doing, that, that, uh, that being a politician, that doing the enterprise of politics is a very different thing from doing the enterprise of law. That there's something quite real about law. It's not whatever we happen to think based on our political views. It's a set of rules and a set of practices and a set of procedures. <laughs> <laughs> it's about things that politicians, whether the new ones who are creating statutes or the old ones who created the constitution, it's applying those politicians' words faithfully. And uh, nobody elected me, you know, and nobody gave me a warrant to say whether health care you know, whether the Affordable Care Act was a good or bad thing. The only thing I have a warrant to do, the only thing I have any charge to do, is to ensure that it's applied in the way that Congress meant for it to be applied and in the way that Congress drafted it. So uh, this is why I say, I mean, lawyers generally, most of you are not lawyers, right? You're not in law school, you're in undergrad. So I'm in law school. I mean, I think lawyers generally are, uh, I think basically law school is all about this is, this is a hard thing for law students. It's like, well, uh, uh, you know, there's just my ideas of right and wrong. And that's, you know, it, uh, I'm not saying that ideas of right and wrong have nothing to do with law, and there are certainly extreme cases in which one would have hoped that ideas of right and wrong would have tra transcended law. And, uh, you know, if you look at Nazi judges, all right, Nazi judges were very by-the-book people. It's like, hey, we've got a law here. We're just applying the law. And um, uh, what you would have wished is that they would have said, you know what, we've actually reached a point in time in this national community where we can't just apply the law. You know, I think some people say absolutely the same thing for, let's say, the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, a law that is sort of our country's worst equivalent of that, that there were too many judges that just sort of treated that as a normal enterprise. It's just, you know, somebody passed the law, we apply the law, that's what we do. But, you know, most of life is not in those kinds of extremes. And certainly, thankfully, most of the questions that come before this country's judges at this time are not in those extremes. And you have to be aware of what you've been what you have a warrant for. And, and uh, you know, as I said, I have zero connections to the American public in the sense that, I mean, nobody elected me. 
Nobody gets to say whether I'm doing a good job. I have life tenure, right? The only point of political contact was when a president selected me and a Congress, and a Congress confirmed me. And other than that, for the next 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years, I'm on my own. And, and a judge should not say, oh, I'm on my own, I get to do whatever I want. You know, and I get to just impose my own political views on the nation. And then that would be a just a, a real corruption of the legal process and of the judicial process. A judge would say, you know, I, I, was, I was put here to do a certain limited set of things. And, and in particular, I was put here to do law. And law is connected in various ways to the political sphere, but is something fundamentally different. And, um, uh, and that's my job, and to go outside of my job would be, uh, you know, as, 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 as bad as, as, you know, any uh, governmental institution going outside of what, their, of what the Constitution gives them as their duty. All right, thank you.